Well, welcome everybody to today's colloquium. Um, we have a nice full house here. Before we start, I have a couple of announcements to make. So please join us on Friday, this Friday, October 27th at 3 p.m. at Harvard Bookstore as Transition Helps Celebrate Worldwide Week. Um, a reading and discussion with contributors from the recent issues on fear and writing black candidates will take place. Next week's colloquium will be delivered by Jenny Sharp. She'll speak on the underwater world of Edouard Duval Carrier's art, mapping a voodoo archive. Now please welcome to the podium, Professor Marcy Morgan, Professor of African and African American Studies and Director of the Hip Hop Archive Research Institute. Thank you. Um, it is as um, such an honor and uh, pleasure to be here on, on this occasion and to have an opportunity to introduce uh, Tuff Poe to those few of you who may not know him uh, and, uh, and to everyone who knows him and to celebrate a lot that he's uh, done and contributed to our community. Um, I'm gonna just say a few short words so that we can really um, spend most of the time um, listening to his presentation. I do want to say this, though. In the fall of 2013, the work of the Du Bois Institute was greatly enriched by the addition of the Nasir Jones Hip Hop Fellowship. Nas is a critically acclaimed hip hop artist and entrepreneur known for his lyrical skills, social analysis, and commitment. He has helped usher in, usher in a creative and critical form of hip hop debate and analysis that reflects on and represents urban youth angst and conflict, as well as young people's intelligence, confidence, dreams, and ambition. A quintessentially honest artist throughout his career, Nas has taken great risks in exposing his deepest vulnerabilities while still staying relevant to a wide audience. He has tackled both intense political issues and hardcore street topics. In so doing, he has inspired a generation. In 2013, uh, Professor Henry Lewis uh, Gates Jr. added, Nas is a true visionary and he consistently shows how boundaries can be pushed and expanded to further the cause of education, knowledge, and social justice. The 2017-18 Nas Fellows include Martha Diaz, James Peterson, and our speaker today, Kareem Jackson, known as Tef Poe. Tef is an exemplary case of how debate, education, activism, coalition building, and commitment can lead to change. Tef Poe was already considered a major force in hip hop and social justice before August 9th, 2014. In 2013, the city of Pine Lawn, Missouri declared August 6th Tef Poe Day in honor of his activism and service to the community. They stated, quote, Tef Poe is one of the strongest voices in conscious St. Louis hip hop and internationally known for his music and activism, end quote. The shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri on wow. August 9th, 2014 changed many things. It also required Tef to put that strongest voice description to the test. He was confronted with how to and when to act on his beliefs, what that might mean in his life and career and for his family, and, he, and who he would be in, the, and who he would ultimately be when he had to face the state-sanctioned violence. One outcome as many of us know, was his co-founding of Hands Up United. If you go to the Hands Up United site, the first page, and I've tried many ways of entering without it happening, it goes donate, okay? And what are you donating to? Too many lives, too many lives have been taken as a result of state-sanctioned violence since the August 2014 murder of Mike Brown. 
We have failing schools nationwide and a government responsible for the poisoning of cities inhabited by people of color. We are working hard to ensure our community has a place to thrive despite the level of repression we face daily. The current world is not one in which we want to live, so we are going to change it. Tefpo has done many, many um, things to support that change, and so now I'm cutting down everything and just going to name a few things that you may not be aware of. Um, one is that last year he was the Charles Warren Center Independent Scholar here at Harvard University. He also is a recipient, um, the organization is also a recipient of the Jay-Z's title grant, which helps fund books and um, breakfast, the People's Food Pantry, the Roy Clay Tech Institute, and various Hands Up United community-led programs. Um, he has um, also continued his work as a hip-hop artist um, and has performed with a number of artists and continues to um, tour with Rum the Jewels um, and has a number of albums he has War Machine, War Machine 2, War Machine 3, <laughs> as well as Cheer for the Villain, Villain and Black Julian. <clears throat> for Tef Poe and other organizers, their persistent call for justice has begun billing, peeling back the visiting layers of injustice, discrimination, and violence. It's not like the layers of an onion, but a scab, deeply buried in America's consciousness. For those that came out of and were inspired by Ferguson, the struggle continues with organizing, resistance, and demonstrations that have not only awakened a sleeping giant, but made the folks that count woke. And I, it is an honor to introduce the 2017 NAS Fellow, Tef Poe, speaking about his talk, The University of Insanity, Culture Shock in the Black American Experience. In true, clumsy, real life self, I just messed up the mic before I even started the presentation. Uh, what's up everybody, can y'all hear me? All right, uh, I'm gonna keep it real, I've done a lot of things in life. I've, uh, and I've, I've lived a, a life that I'm proud of. I've, I've had quite a few experiences. Uh, for me, this is a first. Um, so, it, it takes a lot to get me nervous. I've performed in front of huge crowds, monstrous crowds. So my energy is a little bit unrigged right now, but uh, I'm gonna pull it in because I believe that the information that I'm presenting is important. Uh, I wanna thank Dr. Morgan, uh, also Nas, who is one of my favorite rappers and also a very huge influence on my life. Uh, my two favorite MCs are Nas and Tupac. Uh, when I had no knowledge of the, the outside world, outside of my community, uh, I discovered a culture called hip hop. And I used the word culture very strongly and very purposely. Uh, it had morals and values and heroes and sheroes and villains and entrepreneurs and all types of characters. It was as if uh, the comic books had came to life. And uh, I could look at black people as powerful through the, through, the, through the lens of hip hop. I could look at black people as creative. And I could learn about our Latino brothers and sisters, our Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican brothers and sisters, our indigenous brothers and sisters, all through one piece of culture. So uh, I owe a lot of my life to hip hop music. So I'm gonna jump right into it. I have a few clips that I wanna show. Uh, I was going to show these sporadically throughout the presentation, but I decided to show most of them early on just to kind of set the tone about where I'm going to go. I'm not going to play these entire clips. Some of them are very long. Um, but this, this first one that I'm showing you is from a documentary that a hip-hop group named Rebel Diaz made when they came to Ferguson. It's called the Mike Brown Rebellion. I wrote an article for the Riverfront Times uh, around this time called the Mike Brown Rebellion, and they were inspired by that title to use this for the documentary. 
Um, I'm just going to play a little bit of it. This is from my hometown, St. Louis, Missouri, Ferguson, Delwood. Uh, my mother's front row, she actually lives on the same street as the mayor of Ferguson. So these people are humanized to me. These are real people. Tonight, we got here early, it was mad peaceful. We, we stepped out for like an hour, you know what I mean? And all of a sudden, police started acting up, shooting, throwing bullets. Tell me what happened, though, man. I just, I'm just, I'm Everybody's showing love, like, it is, it's wicked, bro. Like, start shooting for no reason. Then they shot and pulled off. They came back as deep as they are now, dog. Like, you can't just say, oh, go home. Like, you shoot at us to make us go home. Like, what, what cops do that, bro? Like, y'all shoot at civilians to make them leave, dawg. Like, come on, man. Well, where we at, bro? I mean, we in St. Louis, dawg. Like, I, nah, nah. I've been stopped by the, I've been stopped by the police plenty of times growing up in high school. I went to the military. I've been in the military since I was, like, 17. I've been, I'm 21 now. How you feel about, about this, coming home to this? I mean, like, me coming home to this, this here? They make, they make my whole service seem like a fucking joke. Like, I went out there and risked my fucking life for nothing. I got people in the Palestinians been sending me support. This this go worldwide. Fuck this shit. They shoot me some blows down the street like they look like some niggas. I don't say you get work. They treat us like straight niggas. They talking about oh, everywhere around the world, human rights. Ain't nobody well these people can violate human rights. They learned it from the mother the, the, the best. They learned it from these white folks. Ain't nobody got they just ain't black when nobody knew because they wear some snakes babies out there. Ain't nobody been treated like black folks. Nobody. So it's time for us now. This new breed here, they ain't scared of team. You can't breed that on punk stuff. They, 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 they not doing it. And all these longer time Negroes that they sitting down here, NAACP and the rest of they talking from some room. They can't come on the street and talk to these brothers. These brothers they ain't going to touch them. They, they don't respect them. I'm going to be out here with these brothers. They with me and I'm with them. It's enough, man. If terror watching, don't kill me for cutting you off. <laughs> All right. Uh, I wish I could play this entire thing, but I can't. And there's a lot of jewels in this clip. Uh, this is from the curfew tonight of Ferguson. I was out there with a few other people, a few of my friends. Um, it's chaotic. It's crazy. We could have died. Um, I want to play another clip. I don't think this one is going to be as long as that one. Um, this is from... Later on in the, in the protests, as things develop, as different people settle into different positions. Uh, at this point, there's a, we've been at this for a while, so there isn't much fear in the hearts of the demonstrators. Mom, I'm sorry, I'm acting a fool. I'm going to fast forward. You don't need to hear Jesse Williams talk. Y'all all got BT, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, 
So this is from a uh, religious demonstration that was held by a bunch of clergy folks uh, shortly after this, like maybe a day or two after this shoot. Well, I don't want to say a day or two, but a couple days after. Uh, and it was a weird event. The community was present, but there were uh, leaders of faith that the community didn't know. And in situations like what you just saw, uh, many of these people weren't there actually standing with the community, but they would take places where they would speak for the community without actually being present with the community when the police struck. So the community felt the way about it, rightfully so. So I'll play that. Right as the first starts speaking out, I had already planned to address what they was addressing. And um, you see the Muslims, the Jews, the Christians, every other demographic of religion up there, but you don't see the Jews, the vice lords. Fast forward to this young lady, I would feel slighted if I didn't play her part, because this was a very critical part of the night, and then I'll begin talking. How you 
Y'all should really watch this if you haven't watched it. It's great. Uh, a few Ferguson documentaries, but this is really one of the best ones because it was being made as the situation was developing. Um, so, I got one or two more clips that I'll play as I get to peeling through things, but I'll get to it. Um, the fact remains that if you're poor, black, gay, transgender, non-masculine identifying, or female, then you are, you are indeed a target these days. The American diaspora is not inclusionary of women, and most especially women of color. The spoils of colonization are now expected to be understood by inner city victims, or not expected to be understood by its inner city victims. So black organized crime from a white lens is no sophistication involved. White racism would suggest that the Italian mafia is the most invincible unit of criminals ever assembled. According to the orators of pop culture, the mob is nothing more than a few low-ranking immigrant families coming to America under adverse circumstances and finding a way to lift themselves up by the bootstraps. So the fact that they are killers, thieves, liars, just like any other group of impoverished citizens using crime to feed their families is irrelevant. The fact that black people have been forced by proximity to pr participate in criminal activity is also irrelevant. As always, what's good for the goose is not good for the gander. And the fact still remains that often we are the only individuals in the American media cycle accurately discussing this problem from its actual origin. We are not expected to understand colonialism because we are the victims of it. And it's also believed that black criminals are stupid and uneducated. Popular scholars and bourgeoisie Negroes with a couple of pieces of paper attached to the namesake are often shocked by the actual norm and what that's like for underprivileged men and women. So I say we do have an analysis of our condition, but if you're afraid of the ghetto, then that may not exist to you. My friends are former and active game bangers. Many of my loved ones and very own family members are former drug dealers that were locked up and forgotten about during the Clinton administration. So we know what colonialism is because we are the primary targets of its brutality. Uh, Nipsey Hussle, one of my favorite rappers, I think he's an all-around brilliant man. His uh, father is Eritrean and his mother is African-American. Uh, he came from very humble beginnings and he uses a lot of his rap money to bring things back to his community. He started a grocery store in California. Uh, he just bought this strip that a bunch of his friends used to sell drugs out of. And they're turning, they're bringing black businesses into his community and I, I just really respect what he's doing. He put out a rap album for a hundred bucks and Jay-Z bought an abnormal amount of copies of it. Uh, and this is when he first started out. Today he's worth $5 million and he's one of the leading voices in hip hop concerning cryptocurrency. That's part of the reason why I like Nipsey. I think this interview actually made me a fan. Um, so I'm, I'm throwing a lot of things at you, but I, I, I'm painting a picture that I, hopefully you'll get by the end of this. Um, so in a sense, it's as if we're supposed to forget about history and we're, we're supposed to forget about our connection to the history and how the, con the, the history is connected to us and how the history has placed us in the situations that we are in. Uh, it's as if people, people act as if 
we snapped our fingers and all of a sudden there were ghettos in America. No, that had to be deliberately created. Uh, people act as if, uh, I know Tyrone and Pookie and them and they ain't got no passports, so I don't know how the hell they going to Mexico and getting the crack cocaine. I just don't know how they're doing it. It's coming from somewhere. Uh, it, it doesn't grow in the grass in the backyards of the west side of Chicago. Uh, guns don't, you can't pick them off trees. So uh, there's a history attached to these problems and there's a, there's a root attached to the, these issues. Um, and this is if we're supposed to forget wrongdoings. And during the presidential collect election, we were honestly supposed to forget that the Clinton namesake locked up our uncles and cousins while simultaneously throwing our mothers into the street during the housing crisis. And in the most cases, I would say that this is a true indeed patriarchal and sexual analysis. Mm -hmm. To say that a woman cannot be independent of her husband's decisions and professional career, I would typically argue, argue this down with you. But in this case, I disagree because what happens here is the formulation of white political dynasties and the coercion of politics and sophisticated political issues for coverage of social wrongdoings that they're doing. So it's as if they wave the white flag on which y'all, but the fingers are crossed behind their back the whole time. Um, the gangs of Chicago, St. Louis, Compton, and most other similar places all fall under the same creed of general code of conduct. So a crip in California is usually still a crip in Missouri. A gangster disciple in Chicago is most likely still going to be a gangster disciple in Milwaukee. And why is it expected that a representative of the Clinton political machine in 1996 will not be a representative of the same exact philosophies, ideologies, and policies in 2017? The people that eat bombs for breakfast are considered terrorists, while the same person that sent the record-breaking amount of drones to murder them receives the Nobel Peace Prize. We voted for Barack Obama by the multitudes because we always defended whatever identities of the black identity that were there for us to defend publicly. So this by no means means that we agreed with his politics. It meant we weren't going to allow our big brother to be stand, stand isolated while the Republicans tried to use him for lunch. This is a space of resistance and a chance to punch white supremacy in the mouth. And we love those opportunities, typically because no one actually listens to poor black and brown people. So when rich niggas show up, we usually show up to have their backs. When they have a problem, we have their backs. Bill Cosby, guilty as all outdoors, but for some reason, a lot of us got his back. You can see this in the case of O.J. Simpson who wasn't black until he needed to be, but we still protected him. Poor, that's the Illuminati. <laughs> Poor people, young people, for the most part in America, we've always done that. So yes, OJ was wrong, but so was white supremacy. And a lot of people forget that these things start in the, in the gauge of the media from a just drastically unbalanced lens. So while I, I, I hate OJ Simpson, I'm not defending him. I'm saying that the general public always chooses to start in the middle of the story instead of the beginning. And so, for a group of people that have genuinely had, we had tons of philosophy about our, our conditions. We've had some of the best and the brightest men and women that any culture can produce, and we gifted them to humanity. We gave humanity Martin Luther King. We gave humanity Malcolm X, Asada Shakur, Ella Baker. These are our prophets. These are our, 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 our geniuses. These are our Socrates, and we gave them to y'all. And in most cases, all y'all did was gun them down killed them, then co-opted their legacies after they died as if you always loved them. The Republicans love to use Martin Luther King as this a shining example of 
what the moral, moral line actually is, don't they? But they don't tell you that the FBI played an astounding role in killing the man. They basically put the gun in the hands of the killer, if not pulled the trigger themselves. So, uh, situations like this for us are simply an opportunity to punch back when we feel that we haven't been hurt. Uh, if it were not for the riots of 1968, there is no justice for the role of the FBI and Martin Luther King's murder. There's none. And I love Tana Heisey Coates. I think the man is a genius. But he didn't put his body on, line, on the line when Freddie Gray was killed. And when the militarized police force arrived in Baltimore, it was the likes of Eddie Conway, a freshly released political prisoner of 44 years, a 71-year-old former Black Panther who was framed for a crime he did not commit, doing amazing work in the Gilmore Home housing projects, which was the home of Freddie Gray. And he showed up and stood on the line with teenagers as children became the front line of defense between us, ourselves and the police state. And this is absolutely an indictment of these types of actions. It's an indictment of ourselves and the mind frame it takes to watch a man die on live television as we criminalize the children that are defending the neighborhood from the state-sanctioned terror. Corinne Gaines from Baltimore was murdered in cold blood in front of her children by the police as her boyfriend jumped out the window. And I'm questioning what type of mind frame must we have to sit there and watch that and victimize the person that was killed? I'm questioning the audacity that it takes to victimize a woman that was killed in front of her children. I mean, the, the, the audacity it takes to criminalize her. The audacity to, to look at her dead body, to, walk, to, to watch her blood spill on your social media feed with all convenience that you have, with all the privilege that you have of, of watching it and remaining safe. And to totally say that she's wrong, but she's the only person that died in the entire conflict. So our analysis is off. And in situations like this, she's not the insane one. You the insane one for watching it, taking it in, and then choosing to view it from the lens of the actual murderer. We've always lived in Trump's America. It's not a new problem for some of us. And I'm gonna be uh, a little bit more risque and say that some of us survived Obama's America, which actually introduced a new form of American black power to the global stage. I like to call it black imperial power, black imperialistic power. It allows you to march in Selma and commemorate the, rights, the civil rights movement. And at the same time, it allows you to pass comprehensive health care while also silently ordering the CIA to destabilize South American economies in Brazil and Venezuela. It allows you to refer to protesters in Ferguson as thugs while knowing damn well if the rednecks of the, if you leave the Oval Office and appear in Missouri, those rednecks would tear gas you as well. So this is a true radical dilemma. America responded by electing Donald Trump as a means of putting us back in our place. And this is where the conversations change completely from one pendulum to the next. So now all of a sudden in the blink of an eye, women, you are insane for requesting equality. Black people, you are completely insane for burning down property that serves no purpose beyond capitalistic interests in your community, while the people that own that property ignore your agony. Latinos, you're insane for thinking that it's okay to speak Spanish in the classroom, in any other open space in which you desire to use your native tongue. Gays and transgender people, you are insane for, respecting, for requesting humanity, for requesting that they acknowledge your existence. The indigenous, you are insane for reminding us that this land is actually stolen. The American people as a collective, and more specifically the patriarchal European mind frame, which has colonized the minds and the hearts and the commonwealth of this country, you are the ones that are actually insane. And by order of capitalism, you own this universe. So I say, 
What's the probability of the American identity existing without this insanity, which is also deeply connected to white supremacy? Ferguson, Missouri is a small precinct in St. Louis County. It has become a virtual debtor's prison, which is funded solely by the criminalization of poor working class black people. Traffic warrants are attached to men and women, and they keep them from getting jobs, and henceforth driving them into depression, poverty, anxiety, and henceforth making them make way for the realities of child abuse and drug abuse and so many other things like sexual abuse to run, run rapid and unchecked in our communities. This is one example of how small town government like Ferguson specializes in the dehumanization of its black citizens. Let's see here, sorry. Um, I'm coming to my close pretty soon. But I wanna cover one more part. Uh, I go back to the fact that this, a lot of these things happened under the last administration. So a lot of us who were in, rooted in the fight, I went to jail a lot under the Obama administration. <laughs> I haven't went to jail yet under the Trump administration. Uh, so my critique is, I can't dodge the fact that his politics are a part of my critique. While I love and respect him as a, as a black male and a positive influence in the, in, the, in the popular American dialect, my critique is strong of his politics, and I believe that it should be, because we're sophisticated enough people to understand the historical relevancy of a man and to respect his personal accomplishments in one hemisphere, but to also hold him accountable and say, nah, man, you are dead wrong. And I challenge us to think like that. Um, so we lived in Barack Obama's America. And in Obama's America, it's highly unfortunate, but the murder of Eric Garner is completely legal. The gifting of $10.1 million of military aid per day to the apartheid state of Israel created the necessity for rogue police chiefs to travel aboard, seeking training from a state that is willful in the abuse of human rights. By doing so, these police fraternities of America have also partnered in direct association with a government that believes they are executing the will of God by displacing and murdering hundreds of thousands of Ethiopian Jews and Palestinians. These police chiefs return home to do normal police work with imperialist tactics. So in the same way that our country provides military aid to their military, their military provides aid and support for the abuses of American law enforcement, all upon people of color and even white citizens that don't have enough money in the bank to defend themselves. So this is an indictment of the American psyche. The same mind frame that refers to Bill Clinton as the first black president while he bombed, Amer black, while he bombed Somalia. The same mind frame that expected black millennials to flock to the polls for Hillary as if she actually worked to reverse mass incarceration policies. And in a world where it was simply okay for her to refer to black men as thugs or whatever, super thugs and microcosmic killers or whatever she said. A woman that uses patriarchy in her own way to succeed by silencing black women has easily distorted what feminism is actually about. No, 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 man. No. Uh, <laughs> So I'm also making this case, and I want to state to you that the, the reverse side of this coin is the sophistication of the people as we address these issues. So the media would have you believe that Ferguson is a bunch of shirtless Negroes running around, busting out windows, setting things on fire, flipping over police cars, shooting at the cops, blah, blah, blah. When you watch that video, you saw guns in no, no one's hands but one party. You saw weapons in no one's hands but one party. Only one party in that dilemma had the actual ability to murder the other party. Only one party in that dilemma has the actual ability to murder the other party and have coverage of the law. Only one party in that actual dilemma 
is being sponsored by the government that the other party pays through their labor, through their taxes, through their blood, through their sweat, through their identity. Only one party in that out in the dilemma has the stress of navigating all that. The state shows up and does what the state does. The media and the state are an extension of the same regime. So our side of the story never gets told from the accurate perspective. But there's a sophistication to us that we have. While I may not know much about the man in a personal context, and while I may not also respect many of the things that he possibly represents, I sat in the same room as Julian Assange at the Ecuadorian Embassy in England. And I felt that it was not insane of me to want to talk to the man that started WikiLeaks. In the same vein that I felt that it was not insane for me to seek to expose, I mean, insane for Eric Snowden. It was not insane for Eric Snowden to seek to expose the sins of the NSA. And I also want to state that I do not believe that I'm insane for believing in an inconceivable power that allowed my ancestors to cross the ocean in the bottom of slave ships, petrified and crying, and nonetheless hopeful that one day their offspring would come forth and seek justice for the crimes committed against them. I don't believe that this is insanity. You cannot convince me that Dick Gregory and his contributions to our people were insane. The man that said the black woman has never been free. You can't convince me that that's a statement of insanity. In the spirit of being a co-conspirator with radical black traditions all over the planet, and in the spirit of the African diaspora worldwide from Puerto Rico to New Orleans, I dismiss any claims that bash the freedom struggles of this generation. From gangbangers to single moms, y'all are not insane. They're insane for doing these atrocious things to you. You're not insane for reading about Marxism and studying these alternative philosophies that actually have not worked, but they exist. So why not learn about them? You're not insane for seeking to know about those things. I'm not insane for imagining that one day I could be homeless in the streets fighting for a way to survive, relying solely on my talent, relying solely on my skills, relying solely on my aspiration, my ambition, relying solely on the portions of me that this society tried to steal and purge from me to keep me alive. I'm not insane for leaning into that. So I'm going to play this clip from a man I consider my ideological father and philosophical father in terms of philosophies, theory, and a whole bunch of other shenanigans that come along with being a rapper. Um, I think it's important to note that the Ferguson uprising was the prophecies of Tupac Shakur manifesting in human flesh. It was the uh, he had a quote where he said, a lady asked him, what happens if they kill you? What happens if you, they take you out? And he said, y'all don't want to kill me because the N-words is coming after me. When I'm gone, they're not going to have no mercy. They're not going to have no compassion because they witnessed what y'all did to me. And for many of us, in the same way that Malcolm X passing and being murdered signified the end of a fearless era for our fathers, in the same way that uh, they grieved when he passed, I was in high school, and I, I, shed, I cried like a baby when this man died. Because this was the end of a certain portion of my identity, and a certain element of hope, and a certain element of rebelliousness to white America. And for years after his death, hip hop was just boring. Um, so I'm gonna play this quote.
So he goes on and on about a bunch of other things. But uh, I want to recite this, this poem I actually wrote 7 o'clock this morning to y'all. And then that'll be the close of this presentation. But to do that, I want to bring up this picture of myself. This is when I, I was in my early 20s. And uh, I was out here. Always remember, this is what you did to me. When you see me draped up, shining like the Son of God because I came back from the dead, remember, this is what you did to me. When you tell the world about the origin of our conflict, do not forget to tell them you actually tried to kill me. And the sole purpose of your existence was to destroy me. When you speak on the conditions of my people and act as if 300 years of your torturous ways means absolutely nothing, please remember this is what you did yesterday, but today is the day of reckoning. So the problem is not me. It is more so the fact that I will not die and I will not embrace you as my superior. And I will not pray to your idolatrous gods and dignify your lies. I will not humanize your hatred for my existence. And I will not bow down to your insanity. But you will remember that this is what you did to me. When you took my name and used it like it was toilet paper. Remember, this is what you did to me. When your schools excluded us and treated me like I was nothing. Remember, you did this to me. And remember that I have always despised you, and I have never loved you, and neither did I come here to be like you. Remember you robbed me, you shot me, you manipulated me, you hate me, you built your empire with my bones and forgot about me. Remember, this is what you did to me. I told you how much I loved my sister, my mother, and my aunt, and my grandmother, and you raped them. I told you how much I adored my father, and you gunned them down. You fleeced me with your diseased mind. You threw me beneath your jails. You introduced me to the definition of hell. And you did all of this with no mercy. So now when I'm strapped up like Tupac, confident like Malcolm, brave like Harriet Tubman, remember this is what you did to me. Take a long look at this picture. I want you to memorize it. I want you to remember my face and dream about the agony the conquest of our souls has produced. Remember, I created you because I was here first, but you had no loyalty to me nor anyone that looked like me, so you forgot about me. You did not expect me to survive this ordeal. You grew cold and obese while I starved. Remember, I have always had hatred for this, and I have never forgave you for this, and I have never embraced this as the summation of my destiny, so now in the name of this remembrance, I return. And this time it will be different than the last. Because this time I am armed and efficient. And this time I will not remove my jewelry. And this time I will shine bright like a diamond. And this time I will not release my spear from your clutches. This time, you will not define justice for me. This time, we could care less if we die. This time, Our children's children will come for you. For your insanity is nothing more than the most fragile tumor the world has ever known. Remember who you really are and why this is not acceptable. This time, Shaka Zulu climbed through a time portal and found himself in the dungeons of the ghetto, although his self was inebriated and indeed in a coma for 500 years. I spent every second of that coma every millisecond of that coma, every divine moment of that coma, dreaming of your revenge, of my revenge. So I return in the spirit of radical black theology, radical black liberation, radical black feminism, and all our sense of survival to let you know that this is the demise of you. This is the demise of your ideologies and it will give work way to my rebirth for your philosophies are null and void here and you will remember me.
Test. Testing, testing. My dear brother Teff, I want to thank you for your courage, your eloquence, and your willingness to live and die based on your love for black people and for oppressed people around the world. I want to acknowledge that we are graced by the presence of your precious mother. Let's give it up. Give it up for his mother. Teff wouldn't, Teff wouldn't be here without his blessed. Stand, there you go. Stand up, my dear sister. Wouldn't be here without his beloved mother and father. Definitely. We want to thank Professor Morgan and her magnificent leadership, the Hip Hop Archives, facilitating your voice. We, I don't think Harvard has heard anything like this in a long time. I know Malcolm was here in 64. And, he, and at the law school, Archie Epps brought him here. And of course, everybody called hell because Malcolm was laying it out at Harvard in 64. Uh, but to bring what Cedric Robinson, the late great Cedric Robinson, would call the black radical tradition and the voices in the Harvard context, I think is a beautiful thing. And so we ought, to, we ought not in any way to, uh, to downplay this particular moment. I, I had two questions. One is an artistic question which is your relation to Outkast. You talked about uh, Tupac, and I remember seeing Tupac there at House of Lord Pentecostal Church, the National Black United Front under Reverend Herbert Daltrey. He was there every Wednesday at Timbuktu School where I used to lecture. He went his own mother, Finney. Oh, your brother Eugene in here too? Oh, yes he is. Well, you know what I'm talking about. No, I could just see Tupac right now. He's 10 years old, just listening. We talked about Nat Turner, we talked about I had to be well, talked about Garvey, talked about Malcolm, talked about Martin. And this is, what, this is the second question I want to raise. Because you ended on such a note of fire. And I love your fire. And of course, we go back to Ferguson that we want to go into all of those wonderful days there in Ferguson. But when you would talk about revenge rather than justice. Now, you know I'm a Martin Luther King Jr. kind of Jesus-loving free black man. In your, in your thinking, what is the difference between revenge and justice? Because so much love flowing through you. And if justice is what love looks like in public, revenge still, in a way, ties one to the very white supremacist orientation. Because the white supremacist, well, that's what a hatred is. You see what I mean? So when I think of Last Poets, when I think of Gil Scott Heron, I think of Nina Simone, I see you in that tradition. But that revenge versus justice, that second question, and the first question is your relation to those genius from A-Town, from ATL. But salute you, brother, and love you. Uh, that's a loaded one. I'm gonna try to get to all that. Um, so from, I, I feel like this about revenge and justice. Uh, you can have justice in a society that operates as if justice is, 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 is real, as if justice is the reality-based metric in which we're, we're uh, punishing people for the crimes and the, and the atrocities that they commit against other humans within that society. But when you have uh, rogue governments, uh, the same foundational principles in which the colonies left England to establish this country, and we live in a society where many of those same things are occurring, uh, they had a revolution in the name of getting rid of these things. They had an all-out revolution. And people forget that in a society that believes that its actions are just, in a society that believes that justice is actually being uh, dispersed to people, uh, revolutionary acts are actually illegal. So uh, you don't go out and, and sign up to become a revolutionary with the mind frame that each and every step of your life is sanctioned by the state. You know, each and at that point in your life, each and every breath that you make uh, is in direct conflict with the state. So uh, I can't talk about justice uh, in a, in a, in, from, the, from a, a perspective of people that don't have a concept of justice themselves when they arrest my people. Uh, when I know brothers that, uh, like Reggie Clemens, who uh, they had tested his DNA, took it all the way to the Supreme Court. He'd been in prison for 25 years for a crime he did not commit, for a murder that he did not commit. They took his DNA all the way to the Missouri State Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, hey, this, is, this man did not do this crime. We need to look at this evidence again. Send it back. The circuit attorney, Jennifer Joyce, 
Instead of doing the right thing and letting the man out of jail, many of us thought he was going to be released. I started celebrating because I knew he was innocent. Uh, she slaps more charges on the man. He has a whole different trial coming up. The federal government has a 98% conviction rate. It's, it's down there impossible to beat this case. He's up against impossible odds. So justice ain't going to, it may not be served in that case. And I'm hopeful for him because he's a friend of mine. I'm, I'm friends with his entire family. I'm hopeful for him. But when they kill that man, or if they kill that man, there's no justice in that. My only amends for his life is revenge. Do I take that sin on my hands? Do I cry about it? Do I go sign some people up to register to vote? What do I do when they, when they take an innocent man's life and they use the coverage of justice, a fictional concept that we cloud out with all of this Fox intellectualism, a fictional concept? Well, you can come here, kill, murder the indigenous, gun these people down, commit genocide. And then you got the nerve to establish a system that's supposedly based on justice off of that? That's insane. So when we talk about justice, we're talking about it. You might as well bring Wolverine, Batman, Superman, and all them into the equation. Because it doesn't exist in, this, in the context of this system. Uh, outcast. Very important in my life. Um, coming from the Midwest, uh, we're like cousins with the South. I'm really good friends with Killer Mike. He's done a lot of uh, favors for me. He comes from the Outcast, uh, the same campus, Outcast, Dungeon Family. I feel that Dungeon Family, in my opinion, is the best rap crew ever assembled on a generational level, like they got generations of people. There's Dungeon Family first generation, Dungeon Family second, third, all the way down to the fact that people don't even realize their future. One of the biggest artists in the world is actually a, a member of Dungeon Family. His uncle is Rico Way, Outkast's producer. He has Dungeon Family tattooed on his arm. So uh, you can't find a crew that's done what they've done in hip hop. From Goody, from Goody Mob to Outkast to Rico Wade, who was a monstrous producer himself. They started all of this in Rico Way's mother's basement. They called it the Dungeon Family because the basement was basically made of Georgia clay. It was an unfinished basement. It leaked, it rained, the walls were muddy, and he had a equipment in that basement. Day and night, they were making music around the clock. Uh, Big Boy and Dre met at a, a beauty supply store, I, I think, uh, through a mutual friend. Um, they gave me an example of what hip hop sounded like when you weren't from the East Coast, when you weren't from the West Coast. Uh, and they ushered in the ability for me to even have the style I have. I got the Outkast logo tattooed on my arm. It's near and dear to me. Uh, so yeah. Brother West just passed me the mic, um, but I had my hand up uh, secretly on the front row. Uh, Brother Tuff, thank you, thank you so much. I, um, I keep hearing the proclamation that was made by the brother in the video clip at the, uh, at the rally and also something that you said as well. So I want to kind of return, back, return to that. So what you all said was um, this is not your, your, your father's movement, right? This is, this is not the 60s movement. And so I'm, I'm very concerned about speech and discourse. So I, I wonder what is, what is the comparative point that you're trying to make through that, right? The political mm -hmm. point, the strategy point. And who is it directed to and not directed to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of the elders uh, got on my head about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is why I say that. I, I, I was, you know, when this happened, like I said, this, this is, things were more sophisticated than people would know. We had folks who were from St. Louis who worked for the Obama administration. They were texting us. They were friends of ours we went to high school with. They were texting us, telling us like, yo, I, can't, I technically can't say this to you, but the National Guard is coming in by Thursday. The governor and the president are talking. Uh, we would get tips from people from overseas about how to manufacture uh, gas masks via Twitter. Uh, but I said that quote because I, I felt that a lot of that sophistication was going drastically unnoticed and drastically unmentioned, unreferenced. I mean, I lived in North St. Louis at the time, which is a hell zone. It got the highest infant mortality rate in the state. 
brothers in my neighborhood were in the midst of a gang war because they didn't live in Ferguson. So there's bodies dropping everywhere around that time. And I went to the UN, the United Nations, with a group of protesters from Ferguson, New York, some from Chicago. And uh, we talked to a bunch of people, and this is one of the first times in the entire saga that I actually did feel powerless. I ain't feel powerless in the streets. Uh, I only really felt powerless when we interacted with members of the state. When we talked to the DOJ, powerless. Talked to the FBI, powerless. Talked to the police, powerless. Talked to the president, got invited to the White House, powerless. So uh, I understood in the midst of this, while I came into this with a certain element of respectability, even myself. There's clips of me telling people, uh, burning down this isn't going to get it accomplished. And I never tell nobody to burn nothing down. I never endorse that. But what I'm saying, I understand the righteous anger attached to action. But uh, in the midst of all of that, my analysis started to shift. And I, I even felt that I was just as enraged as the people burning things down. So I go from a person who in life would never even be, get within five feet of a police officer to now I'm up in your face. Now we're, we're not waiting for you to be removed as, you, as the body the charges drop is being picked up and taken away by the ambulance. We're not waiting for you. We are not, we're not going to allow you to sit here with your guns after you just killed this man and basically taunt us. No, you got to go. His mother's right there. She just passed out. You sitting here with the gun smoking. You got to go. So I said that because this generation had a sophistication, has a sophistication that has the ability to step outside of the usual narrative of what social justice looks like for oppressed people, and has done that. But all too often, the, the perpetuating narrative that we get is y'all don't know what y'all doing, y'all don't care about the elders, y'all, who, what do y'all want? Oprah Winfrey said it, what do y'all want? And I thought that was just an absolutely ridiculous question in a, in a climate where people are dying. What, what you mean, what do we want? So it's, a, I said that basically as a, a moment of condemnation for the fact that when I, we were in the streets all during the day, we shall overcome, fight back. Nine o'clock come, the clergy went around us up. Hey, y'all, it's time to pray. We already prayed. We prayed before we left the house. I don't even believe in the same God as you. How am I going to pray with you? I don't even know what your concept of God is. But you want to pray? We more sophisticated than that. So that was me saying that it's time to move the, the, the needle past 1965. No disrespect to 1965. I wouldn't be able to say the things I'm saying if, if they didn't do what they did. These people were absolutely genius. But at the same time, we went in a 30-year slumber. So I got to wake up as a young man I'm not an old man, I'm a young man. I do things that young men do. I, I talk and act and function like a young man. I inherited an old problem. So now you want to point the finger at me and say the way I'm doing it ain't right? You the delinquent parent. You took 30 years off the job. The civil rights movement wasn't our baton. We should have never made it to 2017, 2015. If we function in, under the mind frame that these things are truly evil and truly needed to be uprooted from the face of the planet. Now, if we're okay with that, if we're cool with that, if we want to accept that oppressive vices exist in society and now we can sit in the same room with white folks, we can go to the same bathroom as white folks, we can go to the same school as white folks, but them Negroes in Dorchester can't come out here. So I got to function from that lens, you know what I'm saying? Excellent presentation. Very well done. Um, uh, I want to ask uh, the same question we had in the conversation in um, Ferguson. Uh, on Professor West's question, what's the long game? So take me to 2027. 2027, what will be the long game of revenge? What's the long game? We had that conversation before. 
And so what's the long game of revenge in a context where, and I, I take your point about the elders, there's no vision. In the absence of a coherent vision, what's the long game of revenge? Uh, so the goal, first and foremost, is not revenge. Uh, I feel the same way about that, that Malcolm X felt. He did a speech here June 25th, 1964, or they aired it at least June 25th, 1964. He did a speech in Boston. And he said, they asked him a question about, they kept on trying to ask him about violence. And when you really study Malcolm X, the man was virtually as peaceful as they came. And they, but they kept asking the man about violence and what about the violence? And what about, well, da, 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 da. And he was presenting these very complicated theories and ideologies and they just kept going back to the violence. So for me, it's not about revenge. Uh, I don't speak from a position that's seeking revenge for anything. Uh, but I say that we do speak from a, a, a position that says that if you slap me, I'm gonna slap you back. And when you bring MRAPs and tanks 15 minutes from my mother's house, and I gotta think about the fact that a military occupation has now occupied the neighborhood that I grew up in, you're gonna have to see me. You're not gonna be, we are not the docile members of society that are gonna accept this. We will not walk around and act like that it was perfectly normal for Mike Brown to be in the streets for four and a half hours. We won't accept that. So I don't speak from a position of revenge, I speak from a position of complete sanity, complete justification. And this is, for me, these aren't a matter of opinion, these are a matter of facts. And for a lot of people, this is a matter of opinion. Ah, uh, well, y'all might be dying. Uh, I see the bodies, we dying. Ah, uh, yeah, she might have got raped. No, she got raped. So, I don't have a gray area with right or wrong. Uh, but that's all attached to this answer. So, a lot of people want this to be this big return of the black messiah. They want us to have, uh, it's been in six years, they want us to have all the answers to six to 800 years of oppression. In six years, they want me to do what uh, Louis Farrakhan, Malcolm X, Khalid Mohammed, Asada Shakur, Feeney Shakur, Betty Shabazz, Deborah Johnson, Fr Chairman Fred Hampton, Chairman Fred Hampton Jr. couldn't accomplish. In six years, they expect, we got all that flushed out, they expect uh, for a shining Mandela-like figure to emerge out of the madness and the, and the cloudiness of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and for me, that's just the unrealistic expectation. One of my elders told me, don't let these people Martin Luther King you. And that was hella important because my ego could have got overly invested, my ego has got overly invested at moments, and I had to pull back. Um, my ego would have me at home right now. They've been protesting for over 30 some odd days. I would love to be out there with them, but I'm here. But my ego said, hey man, you gotta go, you gotta go. So uh, I think the answer to that question is rooted in what it realistically takes to build an actual movement. I can't say that we're actually at the point of having a mass, sincere social justice movement in this country. It's moving in that direction. It's going in that direction. It can possibly become that. But it hasn't been proven that that's actually what this moment is quite yet. So uh, what I hope is that we will co contribute to this in a cultural sense, where we will change the conversations we're having, where we will start to make art that reflects that, where we will uh, confront the assumptions that, that people make about us in society. And that's pretty much what I do. I could have came here drastically dressed down. I could have took these chains off. I could have appeared totally different, but I'm not going to do that because I'm confronting your assumptions about me. And I felt each and every one of them when I was right here. So. And little do you know that these are cultural items. This is a Coptic Ethiopian cr cross. My people come from West Africa, my ancestors. This is an ump. I'm not gonna wear a cross. I wear an ump because that's a holy sacrament for me. Uh, 
which your assumptions would make you believe that I'm just up here drooled out for no apparent reason. These have no sac like or actual cultural value to me on a personal level. Uh, and that's what the, those are the things that we're confronting. We're confronting the fact that we have our own culture, we have our own heroes, we have our own dynamics, we have our own beliefs, we have our own philosophies, our own ideas, we have our own gods. We have all of that. And it's okay for those to exist. You don't have to bury these things. You don't have to forget about these things. You can learn about your cultural connection to where we actually come from. It's okay to, to bring that into the conversation. It's okay to bring that into the society. It's okay to contribute that. We contribute it all the time, but then it's kind of co-opted. You know, you see black people have made so much music in this country, made this country so much outstanding music. We don't get credit for rock and roll. We don't get credit for jazz. In a hot second, we won't get credit for hip hop. So we're fighting that. Whatever that, that is that has that on autopilot, that's what I'm against. I can't emulate Malcolm. I can't emulate Mega Evers. I'm not them. I'm not taking no bullets. You know what I'm saying? That's not what I'm here for. My mission ain't to die. My mission ain't to crash out. My mission is to live, become an old man, tell these stories to the next generation, and tell them the same thing somebody told me. Don't let these people Martin Luther King you. Because all they're going to do is gun you down and then tell, you, tell your mama that how much they loved you. That's all they got for you. But people expect us to go that route and storm the building. And, uh, uh, uh. I got a computer in my palm of my hand. Why would I do that? I can talk to 15,000 people right now in the press of a button. Why would I do that? So that's what our mission looks like. Uh, Tim. Oh, sorry. Um, Tef, thank you as always for being your authentic self and not dressing up because we're at Harvard. Harvard could stand to have a few less bust of dead um, white men, and so thank you for not um, dressing up, uh, or not. Thank you for not putting on the part of being at Harvard, but being being a disruptor. Always appreciate you. Um, I wanted to ask you quickly about the language of how you're titling um, your presentation around the universe of insanity. It just conjured up for me. Um, this idea of uh, the writer Adrian Rich talks about a psychic disequilibrium that there's an audacity for a dominant narrative that constructs all the, the rules to not see you, but yet construct them and telling you you're not you um, and make you feel like you are, in fact, the insane and crazy one. And I hear you kind of challenging us to think about the lens of who's creating the language of insanity. Um, and I know that uh, there's a lot of talk and sometimes flippant use of words like insanity and crazy um, in relation to legit mental health. So I just wonder if you could um, talk about maybe the sickness that you're trying to, or maybe I'm, I'm projecting, the sickness that you're pointing to around this language of, of who's insane, of what is insane, and the lens from which we are um, approaching this. So up until recently, I, I didn't realize something. Um, Hip-hop always and forever has me coming from a position that is slightly politically incorrect. So within, for that, within me, there's a political correctness. So there's a political incorrectness in Ice Cube going F the police, right? It's a political incorrectness in that, I should say. There's a political, whoa, 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 what are you doing, man, you know? Um, and there's so many other uh, incidents in the culture that are similar to that. Uh, so I actually got this title from a Lupe Fiasco song called Could Have Been. Uh, in the beginning of the song, he says, uh, it's like a universe of insanity. It's a Marvin Gaye sample. Uh, it's a real dope record. Uh, and in the song, he talks about, I could have been this, I could have been that, I could have been this, I could have been a doctor, could have been a lawyer, could have been a basketball player. And he, has like a following punchline that has like this extravagant or kind of silly thing that he would have been doing had he became that. And for some reason when he said universe of insanity and he rapped those lyrics, I just got really lost in the galaxy of that song. And it really, in, uh, that phrase just really inspired me for some reason. And I attached it to the feeling that I had uh, being young and, and walking past gang members. 
and not being a member of a gang, but walking past gang members and having to have that interaction and not knowing like how they were going to react. And the, uh, the, the, the way that my heart would be when it was time to do that, and the way that became a straight up strategic interaction in society for me, like, what do I do? And for me, I, I felt like th that's one of the earliest instances of me feeling uh, just culturally shocked. Just kind of like, wow, this is the world we live in. So um, when I use that term, it's attached to a personal feeling that I think about when I think about those incidents and how I personally feel that maybe uh, I was being coerced into being insane and nobody was able to hear me and, 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 and see it as such. Um, Tiff, uh, Tiff, just uh, one question, if you don't mind. I won't stand up because I think I'm in direct uh, line of the camera. Firstly, thank you for an incredible presentation. And it's so striking, you know, the, the perverse images we see in a strange way leaves me feeling so connected as a human to you at the moment. Um, but my question is, again, you mentioned art, putting back art on the table. And the difference, or rather the relationship, I want to ask you in terms of hip-hop, between the, the craft of hip-hop and the cause. And I would wager a bet to say there are many hip hop artists that share your intellectual struggle. Is there still a case to be made about actually honing the craft so that you do reach the level of those philosophers you speak about, Jay Z and, um, um, Jay -Z and um, the, the Nas? Mm -hmm. um, because, in my estimation, and again, maybe I'm drawing a parallel with the boxing here, mm -hmm. the better boxer you are, the louder voice you have. So, in as much as you're matching the the kind of question about the cause, is there still a way that you would in some way support young people to, to develop the craft so that the two work together? Thank you. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, totally. Um, I, Dead Prez had a quote that said, uh, we don't need RMCs, we need Hueys. Love Dead Prez, good friends of mine, but I slightly disagree with that. Uh, we do need more MCs, we need more painters, we need more uh, artists of all sorts. We need people to make film, we need people to uh, contribute as much of their artistic identity to this subject as possible because art often becomes the cultural relics of that historical time frame. So when people look back, I'm hoping that I leave enough art for them to dive into and feel as if I'm still here, hundreds of years from now. Um, I think that is uh, one of the greatest acts of revolution that we can commit, create as much as you can. You should, you should create every day. What you wear should be uh, uh, reflecting of your creativity. Um, how you walk should be reflecting that creativity. How you talk, the way you shake somebody's hand, the way you comb your hair, as many things as you can uh, produce on a creative level, you should produce and you should leave them behind. And they should become uh, receipts for your identity when you're no longer here. What type of person you were, the things you believed in, the things you ate, the places you lived, the type of people you loved, all of that. That, that creativity is drastically important. To me, if you, if you do believe in God, creativity is one of the highest forms of honoring God. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Tef, um, first off, I want to thank you for an incredibly powerful presentation, man. I'm on leave, and I knew I needed to be here, and I, you delivered, man. I appreciate it. You gave me so much to think about. And um, I just want, I wanted to say one thing and then ask two really quick questions. Is that I think this, this culture shock concept is really important in the, in the way you're subverting insanity, Fanon had this line where he said, the racist in a culture where racism is normal, and that's why you need to be abnormal, right? That we need to, to linger there. And I remember when I first came here from Baltimore, my father uh, went to federal prison for selling drugs, 
My brother went to federal prison for selling drugs. My other brother went to state prison for selling drugs. And then I got here, and I saw more people using drugs <laughs> than I ever saw in Baltimore. <laughs> uh, and I felt insane. Oh, and man. you know, I see, I, I feel it. It's a weird thing. I've never actually said this to anybody, but I feel it now when I go to the movies a lot or t watch TV. It's like cocaine drug use is so funny. It's like Scarlett Johansson movie, and like the girls hanging out using cocaine, and Leo DiCaprio movie, and he's like using cocaine. It's supposed to be hysterical, and all I keep thinking is like, man, my my family's lives were taken from them, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and this is a joke. I mean, it makes you feel insane, you know. Um, because it's, it's, it's enough of an open secret that we're supposed to laugh at it, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but yet we got to have this whole militarized police force and we're killing people all over the world over this thing that's the open secret and it does make you feel insane. And I really appreciate you for crystallizing that in a way for me. Um, so I wanted to say that and then I wanted to ask you two, two questions. I'm always impressed. I think um, your, your answer to Maisha's question was really important about the way that your critique of the, the, the civil rights frame is in part a defense of your own sophistication and agency. And one of the things I always try to bring up to students is to let them know how long y'all were out there in Ferguson, right? Most people think you're out there for a couple days, mm -hmm. but you're out there for over a year. Mm -hmm. It's like the Montgomery bus boycott. It's we that. actually left it. We left the Montgomery boycott. Right, right. So it's, like it's, it's that level of sophistication. And so one of the things I've always been impressed by and I wanted to hear you say a little bit more about it. You talked briefly about it, just, but this question of like organizing gang members. Mm -hmm. So like in the middle of this, you got this gang war, people are killing each other over the, the underground economy and street life, and then all of a sudden you're organizing people to be a part of politics. And you just said a little bit about that, but I, I'm, to me that's like the crucial question right now because mm -hmm. it, and this is the second question, is like something like the, the black imperial power that you named, which was also a really powerful point. That makes me real skeptical about black solidarity now, yeah. right? So that, actually, I'm kind of drawing the opposite conclusion that the more Bill Cosby's we have, the more black imperial power we have, the less willing I am to extend black solidarity, the more fragile I think it is when I see them turn their back on the same people. Like, the Bill Cosby would benefit from black solidarity and turn his back on the same people suffering in Baltimore mm -hmm. or Ferguson, mm -hmm. things like that. And so, so I, if those people have to fend for themselves, if, if them and their allies, people like us trying to, trying to help, how do we organize people who haven't particularly been involved in politics, people who are incarcerated, people who've been in the street? Because that's where it looks like it's going. Mm -hmm. So um, one thing I learned about that is that uh, for one, none of us actually organize the gangs. The gangs have their own laws and subculture, their own beliefs, their own people, chiefs, shot callers, so forth. So does they organize themselves in moments like this. Uh, you need people that can become liaisons to them, people that uh, are capable of speaking to people that are in the gangs, people that the gangs won't run off, but none of us actually organize them. No regular civilian organizes the, the gangs. Uh, but that's also a very important piece of the discussion because a lot of people don't know, back to what you were saying, the things that people don't know. People don't know that uh, the new Black Panther Party, who we can have several different views of, the, of them, but they were in Ferguson. They were directing traffic, taking people to grocery stores. Uh, they had a very hands-on present. Uh, they had a local chapter. Uh, which was basically purged very early in the Ferguson conflict. Uh, and a lot of those brothers are still in jail. Uh, and it just, it didn't make the news, like probably within the first couple weeks of it. Um, but that was, a, that was a type of sophistication that I had never seen from black people in the streets, where there were days that a lot of us refer to back home as the day we got free. Uh, nobody paid for food. Uh, children running around freely playing in the areas that the adults had created. Arts and crafts out. Uh, people lined up at the gas station pumps in Ferguson with free food. Dudes that I know from the streets, no, known drug dealers, pulling up, popping the trunk, saying, unload this food and get this to these people. Uh, 
when the police flooded Canfield, one of the first nights that I was down there, it was the street guys, the drug dealers, that made them leave without guns, without the usage of guns. And that's where, that's actually the first moment where I said, wow, this might actually be something. So, uh, I feel like if we, we, we have to have change, we have to realize what we're talking about here. So if we're talking about uh, amending a couple of laws and uh, putting forth legislation and getting X, X amount of people registered to vote so we can funnel them into whatever the next Democratic candidate is, that's a whole nother conversation. But resistance of radical state terror, resistance, rather you might view it wrong or right, you can, view the, you can view this as wrong or right. You can view uh, Mike Brown's position in it as wrong or right. You can view my position in it as wrong or right. Several other people. You can have an objectified lens to that. But the reality of the situation is you, yourself, will not drive home tonight and see a tank five minutes from your house. And if you do, you won't take it and just ride off into the sunset. So. You, I, we're having a humanistic response to want a dilemma on this level and a dilemma on that level. But the dilemma on this level, for me, drives me a little bit crazy because it's, it's cool for us to have helicopters hovering above our houses. It's cool for a young man named Timothy Keith Jackson to be called up by the DEA when George Bush was senior was president, his first address to the nation. It's cool for Bush to say, hey, I know I ran Contra and I spent several years in the CIA directing it and bringing in cocaine to sponsor our war against these people. I know, I, I know we did that. But this crack thing, we didn't see that coming. That's a problem. So it's cool for him to have the DEA call a young man that was a high school senior in Washington, D.C. by the name of Timothy Keith Jackson. It's cool for him to have him contact this man, set up a botched drug deal, where the microphones weren't even working, the footage was barely working. It, it, it was all they all they were, they weren't sophisticated enough to even set somebody up. They, they called this young man and said, "We want to meet you. We want you to, to meet us at the White House." And he literally goes, "Where's the White House?" He lives in Washington D.C. So they have him meet them at a park across the street from the White House, and they buy crack cocaine from Timothy Keith Jackson. And the only reason we even know that the government was involved in this is because the operation was messing up and his lawyer started to reveal these things when he went to trial. But that same, in that same incident, George Bush, the president, goes on TV with the crack that they bought from this young man and reveals it to America and says, we're about to start the war on drugs. To me, that's you saying we're covertly about to start the war on black people because they're interfering with my profits. They're taking my profit and they're putting this garbage on the street. This ain't pure cocaine, what is this crack? So all of that is acceptable, but we wrong for saying we won't accept it. Like it's to, it just drives me wild. It drives me absolutely wild. John Kerry ran for president, said out of his own mouth he knew that the government was complicit in bringing guns and dope to black communities. He said this. The other insane part of that for me is the fact that a black president, a man that lived in some of the communities for a short spell, he won't make a statement nowhere near close to that. And we're not asking for physical action. We're not asking for him to go to Chicago and physically shut the drug houses down. We're asking for an acknowledgement of the issue from more than a covert manner. A very honest conversation. That's not going to work with these kids in the streets right now. The covert nature is dead. It's not going to work with them. They want it raw, they want it rugged, and they want it honest. And if you can't give them that, then you're going to have what you had on the screen. You can have, um, th thank you so much. This, you know, it's been such a rich, uh, critical discussion and and uh, presentation. I, I just have one last question. 
I know you're working on a book, and could you tell us a little bit about it, and also, who is it for? What, what do you want the book to do when it comes out? And hopefully, you can give us an idea of when it might happen, when, when it might come out. Uh, I'm still working on it. I've been working on it for about three years now. Um, I'm blessed to be here to have the space to continue to work on it. Um, so I've struggled with this book a lot. To be I'm, I'm, my, my game is just transparency. So I've struggled with writing this book a lot. Uh, not that I don't believe I have the talent to write the book, the perspective, nor the experiences. I struggle with uh, how much truth I'm going to have to put in this book from my perspective. Uh, that deeply bothers me, and I'm used to being very unapologetic about telling the truth. Uh, and the only reason I shoot it like this is because in so many spaces, y'all could talk to so many other people that are just not going to take this opportunity to say some of the things that I'm saying. So I feel that I have a divine mission, a divine purpose, a divine order to say these things. If I don't say these things, I will be in direct conflict with myself and in direct conflict with my beliefs, and I will quite frankly not be able to live with myself. So I feel now that I'm moving into new territory with writing this book because I'm talking about uh, a lot of the things that went down in Ferguson, a lot of the things that have happened in St. Louis, Missouri, which is a very corrupt place. Uh, I made the statement that Missouri was the new Mississippi. Elders came for me over that. But this is the same state that the NAACP issued a travel warning for black people, saying, hey, you might not want to go to Missouri, y'all. It sounds like the new Mississippi to me. Not saying Mississippi don't got its issues still, but if we're operating in terms of this being a new era, a new moment, a new place and time in history, then there's a new this and there's an old that. So um, that's the book uh, is called A Rebel to America. That's a, actually a Nas lyric. So it's ironic that these things have happened how they have happened. Uh, Nas has played a profound uh, role in my life musically. Uh, his interviews, you know, back home in the projects in Queensbridge, you know, they were so emotional and so real and uh, just very human. And that's where I get a lot of that from. Like, I, I borrow a lot of that from his approach. Uh, a lot of people, uh, some people, I should say, try to compare me to Tupac and hip hop. I don't like that. I don't lean into that whatsoever. I do feel that, if anybody, I am trying to be a Missouri extension of what Nas is, a Missouri extension of maybe even Scarface to a certain extent. But uh, Pac is something totally different. You can't compare somebody to that. And I actually hate when people do that. I hate when people compare, oh, 50 Cent is out. He got shot five times. Oh, he's the new Tupac. It take more than that to become Tupac. <laughs> so, uh, so I, you know, I hate that. You know, they, they, they never talk about the radical traditions in which he was raised, the fact that Asada Shakur is his godmother, the fact that his own mother, Afeni Shakur, was a member of the Black Panthers, defended herself against the state of New York successfully, got off not guilty. Uh, they never talk about Matulu Shakur being his stepfather, Geronimo Pratt, who told people COINTELPRO was a real thing and nobody believed him, and his first words when he got out of prison was, do you believe me now? Uh, these are the individuals that raised Pop. So none of us got that, that, that ingredient. None of us have that. We, we don't have that life. So, um, but I do feel like in, 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 in contrast to Nas, I, I feel a different type of connection. Uh, Two-parent household. Uh, you know, um, a very observant man, a writer at a very young age. People don't realize that he wrote Illmatic at 16. Uh, and in my own city, I was kind of viewed as a lyrical prodigy, so I leaned into that, you know. Uh, so the book talks about uh, my influences, the corruption in which I was born into, 
some very deep things about how, uh, things that people just may not realize about Missouri and St. Louis and how something like Ferguson can come out of that. The East St. Louis riots where hundreds of black folks were murdered and boarded into their homes in 1917. Uh, many of them would come outside and get shot in the head because of angry mobs. People don't realize that prior to that, St. Louis played a great role in the labor struggle and uh, where blacks and whites in East St. Louis unified during the railroad strikes. And there were interests from very powerful and wealthy white members of society that said, you know what, we can't add this. This type of unity has crippled our business, it's short, shortened up our dollars, what are we gonna do about this? So that unity was deliberately filibustered and destroyed through racism and through capitalism. Uh, and some of those same families that sparked those riots, that benefited from those riots financially. You could drive by buildings in St. Louis and you see their names on the building. And most people ain't gonna take time to do the history. So they don't even know when those people inherited that building and they still got that building. And they're gonna have it for generations upon generations upon generations upon generations. Meanwhile, what do we have for generations upon generations upon generations upon generations? We got East St. Louis, which is burnt down, desecrated, looks like Baghdad, and has a 1% employment rate. That's what we got out of that deal. So in this book, I'm talking about those things and bringing some context to that.